are we human beings separate from nature? Or are we part of it? So this is a question that kind of plays in my head a little bit. And I'd like you to just like try and wander off for a minute with me to a place that you feel at peace, maybe by yourself. It could be, I don't know, your home, a garden. For me, it is, it is, no, not here. <laughs> it is swimming in the Red Sea amongst corals. This is where I feel at most peace. And I tend to think of myself as being alone in this kind of place. I am snorkeling. But the reality is, are we really alone? Am I separate from this natural world that's, that's around me? Are you alone when you are in your moments in these places? Now, this organism tells a different story. So this here, and I'm sorry for squeamish people, but this here is a mite follicle that actually lives on your skin. And it's a mutualistic relationship that it has with our body. It feeds on um, dead skin, on oils, and it's, it's helping us. And we are full of these kinds of organisms on us, in us. Actually, only 10% of our cells are human cells. So I want us to just take a moment and thank all our organisms that are, are essentially taking care of us and are us. And maybe we want to thank the organisms of our neighbors and give them a little bit of love as well if you have any neighbors next to you. And, be, and above all, what I want to also acknowledge is that we are here on lands of other people that have lived here for a long time. The Ohlone are the ancestors of this space we're in. So let's give thanks to them as well. So I am not an expert on the science of non-duality. I am, however, here to try and engage you a little bit on how we can reconnect to nature. Now, this is a, it's a discipline called biomimicry. And the idea behind it is this concept that we are nature, but that nature also offers solutions for us to kind of reconnect, to learn about how we can better fit into this world. So a little bit of a history about myself. So I come. This is not a very um, exotic picture of Egypt. <laughs> this is Cairo. And this is a, a, a picture I chose because I live in one of the most populated and polluted cities in the world. And so in these places, you feel stifled. How do you reconnect? How do you find yourself? How do you find a connection to nature? And actually, I did. So there was a. The previous presenter also had some rowers, but this is actually me rowing in the middle um, on the banks of the River Nile. And as I would go there to kind of release my energy, I started realizing that actually this body of water, this history of water also carries more than that. There are willow trees that are shading on the banks of the river that provide ecosystems for insects and birds. Some of these birds include kingfishers that are able to majestically dive into the water, catching their, um, their, the, the fish, their prey, in a very elegant, elegant way. And then deep in the water, you have catfish that are scurrying for all the detritus. And so this is an ecosystem that functions in the midst of this crazy, chaotic city. And it works. It has adapted to be here. And so my brain started thinking, is there, are there lessons that we can learn from that? And little did I know that this was an actual field called biomimicry. Looking at nature's genius consciously for, to create a better world for ourselves, a more sustainable world. And this is Janine Benius who coined this term in the late 90s. And a whole movement grew out of that, of how do we learn from these strategies? How do we understand what the biological world has to offer, given that it has been 
solving its problems for 3.8 billion years. Nature has been you know, trying to R&D, so to speak, for the past 3.8 billion years. But oftentimes people know biomimicry in the tech world. That's, maybe we can see a show of hands. How many of you had heard of biomimicry before? Okay, not so many, but when people know about it, often the media talks about biomimicry in the tech world. I'm just going to give some examples so that I can contextualize it. So products that are inspired from organisms. So on the left side, you have um, this paint that self-cleans that is inspired from lotus nanostructures that actually allow it to stay clean without needing toxic materials or chemicals. Nature does it in a whole other way. Or on the right side, a redesign of a fa uh, one of the fastest trains in Japan, the Shinkansen train, that would actually create the sonic sound every time it came out of a tunnel. And it so happened that there was a bird watcher on this uh, team of engineers who saw how the kingfisher was able to enter the water without creating any wake. And understanding that it's moving from one pressure differential to another, started thinking maybe we can redesign this, and they did. And not only did this train stop making the sonic sound, but it also became more energy efficient. But this is not why we're here and why I'm here. So biomimicry is, is a growing field, and it has principles that are attributed to it. And these principles are actually extrapolated from the natural world. So these are 26 principles that exist in nature that ultimately are pushing what nature is pushing for, which is to create conditions that are conducive to life. That's what nature is ultimately trying to do. And there are many different ways of doing that. And again, I'm not gonna go into the details of it, but being locally attuned and responsive to the environment you're in, recycling all materials, using chemistry that is life-friendly, but more specifically, I'm going to hone in on one part of it, which is this idea of local attunement. And under that, the idea of cultivating cooperative relationships. Now, famous biologist Lynn Margulis said, life did not take over the world by combat, but by networking, by cultivating relationships. Oftentimes, we think of the natural world as predator-prey and these competitive kind of systems, which is true, that exists. But more often, it's actually about cooperation. It's actually about cultivating these networks that allow life to create more conditions for more life. And I'm going to give you a few examples of these. Um, so here, for example, are prairies, be it in... Uh, the Americas or in, uh, in Africa, prairies need these large animals like buffaloes or bisons to actually come through and start etching into the ground and defecating and bringing uh, seeds with them. By doing that, they actually bring in more biodiversity. They bring in more uh, grasses. And once they pass through, you have these grasses that are uh, flourishing, And so you create out of this what seems like a very disruptive kind of space, and actual ecology is all based on these relationships. Wetlands are another great example, where the purpose of the wetland is actually to filter water. But by doing that, it does more than this. It creates habitats for crustaceans and insects. Um, and it does that while creating habitats, but also by creating these buffer zones that actually filter water. But if you go deeper also, you go into the soil, you're going to find that these collaborative relationships exist even in the soil. Now, the science behind soil is still a growing and emerging science, but there are intricate relationships between microbes and mycorrhiza and how they move nutrients around and, and, and collaborate. Without these fungal net networks, there would be no forest. There would be no movement of resources or carbon that gets sequestered. Now, Val Pamud, who's a, uh, an eco-feminist, talks about how that she is vastly outnumbered by tiny companions. That to be one is actually to be many. 
I want us to start imagining that there is no barrier between us, but that there's all these microbes that are circulating with us. Not in a bad way, in a way that allows us to flourish and allows us to continue our digestion and continue the um, uh, li you know, removing all the dead matter that is this on us. We are this celebration of so many different species and we ultimately are nature. So human nature is an interspecies relationship. Now this is now going to take me into an another chapter, which is actually my own passion. So biomimicry is my entry point, my tool, but my love is for food. Because I think that food is one way for us to connect together as human beings. And ultimately, my life's work and my research is to try and figure out how we can create systems that are regenerative. So even though food sometimes is seen as just nutrition, food is much more than that. It is our culture, it is our history, it is a way to interact with each other, but unfortunately, the way that we have created our food today in the modern world is very industrialized, it's very um, re uh, reductionist, it's very harmful to the environment, but also harmful to people who have produced it over the years. And so I try to think of how we can create a regenerative food system, but specifically, given my background, in arid regions, which actually are going to become more and more the predominant regions of the world and which currently have about 2 billion people. So how do we create relationships between us using food inspired from how nature works to create a world that's regenerative? Gary Nabahan is an ethnobotanist that is in, in Arizona and he says that if we started to think like a desert dweller, be it a giant cactus, like a saguaro, or a nomadic um, Bedouin sheep herder, that this is where we can get some of our inspiration. And so I'm going to tell you some of the just thoughts of things that are popping in my head right now. And again, I am inviting you just to reflect with me. These are not like standard answers or anything. But like we said, you know, prairies are part of nature and we are consumers of meat. And yes, I know right now a lot of people are eating less meat, which is good, we need to eat less meat. However, what if the meat we were producing was actually inspired by natural systems that grew regeneratively? And so there are farmers around the United States and in Africa that are looking at these ideas of holistic grazing that mimic the movements of these large animals so that the soil can regenerate itself and the grasses come, come back. Or looking at how we can create in an arid region canopies of, of uh, production, not in the sense of like these monocrops of cornfields after cornfields, but creating drought tolerant trees that have under them vegetable produce that together work in this relationship. Some people are calling this permaculture, but this is an ancient tradition. It's not something new. It is just being re-termed right now. Or specifically looking at organisms in nature, like the cactus, for example, that creates this boundary layer between itself and the outside world to try and protect itself. And this is inspiration for minimal kind of like low-tech, like trellises and things like that or going deeper into the soil and understanding the relationships of mycorrhiza and carbon, which is work that is being done right now. These are soils that um, um, are in, in an area in Arizona that was three years ago, just pure clay. But the relationship that these farmers are having with the land and giving mycelia and microorganisms and love above all, is allowing for this place to flourish with soils that are black and full of nutrients. But it doesn't end with just the farming practices. It has to also extend to an understanding of what food can be. And so this is stuff that I'm still exploring right now. So I'm in Arizona in, uh, in Phoenix area, which is a land of Tohono O'odham people who have a long history of of being on this land and have had discovered relationships with 
um, um, how to cultivate the land. So there's relationship between corn and tepary beans and squashes that grow together in these mutualistic relationships. And it so happens that these mutualistic relationships are also good for their health. So Tohono people, unfortunately, are now get it, have some of the highest rates of diabetes. And yet these foods have low glycemic index and are actually good for them. So their, their history also tells them something because they learned how to adapt to place, to understand place. But they're also foragers. They learned how to have a relationship with plants that are in the area, like the mesquite that is, creates these pods that can be turned into, into a flower. But it's not just about taking, because these are plants that are there. It's about learning how to forage in a way that is honorable, with honorable harvesting and giving back, including things like, you know, Cacti that they harvest in, to make uh, juices out of them and prickly pear, and, uh, I mean, uh, juices and, and, and jams and so forth. But I also am exploring my own relationship to my own heritage. So I come from Egypt. And we traditionally have been growing grains. But with the industrialization of food, we have lost our heritage grains and are trying to rediscover some of these different foods, including old recipes of leafy greens and this is a taro dish, bringing all these different things back. So it's also a connection, not just to land, but to stories and ancestry. This one here is actually a product that is a collaboration between dairy and microorganisms. This is called kishk, and it's found um, all over the Middle East. But the way it's done in Egypt is that this is a fermented dairy, which is placed into these clay containers, and Generation after generation of these clay pots have these microbes that have continued to grow so that they can churn up and create this, this product that then we have wheat added to it and it turns into these balls that then are left to dry in the sun. And this food happens to be one of the most nutritious things that a young child can, can uh, eat in the early stages because it has the whole spectrum of amino acids that they need. And yet it is a very simple food that is left in shelves and can store for up to a year without even needing refrigeration. So these are traditions that are collaborations with our own ancestry and our histories, but also by understanding the places we are in. And finally, the call that I kind of have of that I've learned from being here in the US for the past two years has been in connection with indigenous people who are trying to understand what it means to be a native or to eat your ancestry, basically, eat the foods of your ancestors. And this is a picture by Roxanne Swenzel, who's a Pueblo from New Mexico. And this is her idea of what trail mix should look like in their place with local pinions, with local currants, with um, pumpkins that are locally grown. And so, Food is a way for us to reconnect to our lands, to possibly understand our relationship to nature. And so my final words are take time with ourselves, all of ourselves, with all the organisms on us. Try to observe the natural world and be in tune with it and use an opportunity to reconnect with our foods. Thank you. Mm -hmm.